All right, we're back to our Jesus story, and in Mark chapter 8, he has crossed the Sea of Galilee to the east side, where most of the people there are Greeks, and it's a Gentile region called Decapolis, meaning the inhabitants are not Jewish, which is a real problem for his disciples, who have been schooled in religious prejudice all their lives. He's got his main 12 guys with him because he's about to demonstrate a principle that will be absolutely crucial to the future of the church. It's what we uh, covered, what he covered in Mark 7, that not only is all food clean now, but all people are clean. We looked at this last week. Jesus is exposing uh, the errors in centuries of Jewish religious tradition. He's tearing down all kinds of practices and prohibitions that would put up barriers for the spreading of the gospel. And it's so alien to everything that these 12 apostles know, it's not making any sense to them. I mean, it's just like, Jesus, what are you saying? All their lives, they've believed it was their duty as Jews to have nothing to do with Gentiles. You were, you were considered unclean if you touched a Gen, you know, were hanging out with the Gentiles. So, you know, they are genuinely shocked by what Jesus is doing here. He's challenging their entire perspective on how God works and what God expects. And now he's taking them back into Gentile territory for more on the job training here. Mark 8, 1 says, another large crowd gathered. Since he had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And the disciples say, verse 4, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Now, now if I had been Jesus, <laughs> I would have said, seriously? I mean, come on, guys. Remember Mark 6? Come on. That's just a chapter ago, you know. This is a rerun of what just happened. Come on, 5,000 plus hungry people. I ask, what are you going to feed them? You say, there's no Sam's, there's no Costco. We can't be, can't be done. We cannot feed them. I say, what do you have? You say, a little boy's lunch. Remember the five loaves and the two fish and how you gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers? Uh-huh. Well, let's do it again. And this time he feeds 4,000 plus with seven loaves of bread, and they end up with seven basketfuls of leftovers. Basically, he's repeating the same miracle for these Gentiles that he did for his Jew Jewish brothers. So, which means, that means something. That means he's revealing himself as God to them too, because this is a creative God miracle. He's calling Gentiles to follow him, which is a radical new idea. He's saying, look, guys, from this point forward, you're going to accept anyone, and you're going to expect me to do for miracles for the Gentiles, just like I did for my Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, it's easy for us to nod our heads and agree with that intellectually, but convincing our hearts to go there is a different story. Back in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, during the Jesus movement, God was doing a lot of new things. I mean, it's a lot of what the Apostle Peter says in Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days, and they'll prophesy. And when I witnessed that happening among Catholics here in St. Louis, I was shocked because I grew up in the South in a church that majored on spiritual gifts. In fact, in my little world, we owned that revelation. That was ours. You know, we had taken heat for that. We were called ho holy rollers. I mean, we had been rejected by other denominations for holding fast to that truth. That was our truth, you know. And uh, I grew up at the end of a, the healing revival here in America, and I had heard the stories. In fact, I even got to attend just a handful of those meetings at the very end. My grandmother had spent most of her adult life with this huge open wound all up and down her leg. And, uh, and she would have to dress it every day, to put gauze and stuff on it every day. And my dad said he would cry watching it because she was in so much pain. And it was just, it was a, a constant thing. And so one night, they go to a William Branham meeting. He was one of those healing guys, and, and, uh, and he calls her up in this massive, cam, you know, 
auditorium, he calls her up front, tells her all kinds of details about her life, knows her name, everything about her, and, and things that he'd have no way of knowing. And then as people watched, I mean wide-eyed, this thing, he prays for her, and it dries up right there before their eyes, completely goes away. The only thing that was left was this little brown patch of skin. You know, the skin was a little discolored the rest of her life, but it was completely healed. And so, <laughs> you know, we had stories like that, spectacular stories. I grew up with a family of fishermen. You know, we were fishermen's paradise down there, and everybody in my family fished. And so we routinely have fish feast. And, uh, and in one of those, I got a bone caught down my throat. And uh, I'm a little guy, and I'm thinking I'm dying. My, my other grandmother says, come over here, Ronnie. Lays her hands on me. That thing melted in my throat. I mean, I, I remember it was the most amazing thing. It melted in my throat. So I had a history in this. But now God's moving outside our camp. He's doing stuff, you know, obvious miracles with a bunch of people who pray to Mary. Now, I know that sounds terribly judgmental, doesn't it? <laughs> but I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a product of my upbringing. I'm thinking, Holy Spirit, what in the world are you doing? You know, I went to their meetings at Visitation Academy over here to see it for myself. And there's God moving through priests with collars and monks in robes and nuns in habits. And they're open and they're humble. And it's absolutely a work of the Holy Spirit. And it is blowing my mind. Now, I know if you, you know, grew up Catholic, that's ridiculously judgmental, but that was my background. I mean, Catholics were taught that we were off the wall, and we were taught that they were. So it was just, you know, the way it was. And now the Lord is just messing up everything by blessing all of us. <laughs> and it just seriously wrecked my religious prejudice, showing me that, you know, he's got all kinds of kids who don't share my religious traditions and background. I mean, it was, it, the water level just rose, and it floated all boats. I mean, all the fences disappeared, and we're just, here we are together, you know. We're all just celebrating the Holy Spirit, and amazing things are taking place. It's the same thing that he's telling the 12 here. From this point forward, receive everyone who comes who. who comes in my name. I want you guys to radically reject any trace of prejudice, whether it's ethnic or gender or age or social status, denomination. What he's saying here, this is a big deal to God. And I just want to say what we see him doing here at Grace is something we want to celebrate and protect and never take for granted. How many of you come from a Catholic background here? See, there, there you have it. How many of you from a Baptist background? Look at that. Those are the two huge ones. How many from some other denominational background? We are a merry mixture, aren't we? I mean, it's just an amazing thing. And it is, again, just a, a sign of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Well, at this point, Jesus and the disciples return to Galilee where the Jewish religious leaders find him. And they are, they are ticked. They are looking for an argument. Verse 11 says, to test him, they ask for a sign from heaven. And this time they want more than another healing miracle. They, they want a Joel 2.10 kind of demonstration that he's who he claims to be. This is where the Old Testament prophet predicts the Messiah when he comes, the, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. Pharisees are saying, all right, you're really our Savior. Make that happen. Verse 12 says, Jesus sighed deeply, basically He's not going to dance to their demands. He's already done enough to prove who he is. But Matthew 16, 4 adds this to the conversation. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Which is interesting because he's referring to the Old Testament prophet who got swallowed by fish. Remember, he, wouldn't do what God, he didn't go where God wanted him to go, and he ends up in a boat that's in a storm and they throw him overboard and he gets swallowed by a fish. And for three days, he's in this deep, dark pit of Leviathan's belly. And contrary to the children's Bible story version, he's not roasting s'mores over a campfire in there. I mean, he is dead. He is totally dead. In fact, you read Jonah's account and, and you know, he goes down to Hades. Three days pass, 
the giant fish regurgitates his body, his dead body up on shore, and God brings Jonah back to life. Jesus says, that'll be your sign, the sign of Jonah. And he's also talking about the end of the age when he returns in the clouds and every eye will see him and all the graves will be opened and the dead will be raised. <laughs> These guys have no clue. They have no grid for what he's talking about, especially at this point. Now they're crossing back to the east side. Mark 8, 14 says, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf that they had uh, with them in the boat. And Jesus starts talking, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And they're going, looking at each other, now what does he mean? You know, what is, what's that supposed to mean? And the group consensus is, since there are 12 of us and only one loaf of bread, he's warning us that the Pharisees are making bad bread. <laughs> they are so fixated on not starving. <laughs> and you know, as a fellow food addict, I can, I, I can understand their point. You know, I'm always thinking about my next meal, you know, and so that's where they're at. And once again, they totally miss his point. He's not talking about natural bread. He's talking about the corrupt teaching of the Pharisees, the, their hypocrisy and abuse of power and unbelief. But it sails right over their heads. And Jesus has got to be thinking, guys, really? I mean, I think you ought to know I can handle dinner for 12. I mean, I just multiplied food the second time for a you know, 4,000 people, you're acting like it didn't happen. Are your hearts that hard? This is the same thing that sets up with us. And I'd be really judgmental and go, yeah, Jesus, except that that's what I do. God does something for us or says something to us that stirs our heart and melts us, and, and we just consume it and go right on about our business as usual, and we're, we, we, where we don't respond to Him with any kind of new expectancy, Nothing changes, like nothing really happened. That's how our hearts get hard. It's a, it's a natural human process. And in verse 17, Jesus says, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Can't you guys connect the, got, the, the dots here? Don't you remember? Do you forget this quickly? A disciple is somebody who makes remembering a priority. It's one of the great lessons of the Bible. In Deuteronomy 4, 9, Moses tells the children of Israel, he says, be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen and let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. And in Deuteronomy 8, 11, he says, be careful, you do not forget the Lord your God. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, hard, in other words. There it is, right there. And you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, with all those miracles. Because they got to be thinking, there is no way we will ever forget. And our kids will never forget this. God's going, oh, yeah, you will. Unless you say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this well for me. But remember, the Lord's your God. Remember, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors. Over and over and over, God is instructing them to remember He's the one doing all this. Teach it to your children. Talk, to, talk about it often. It's the reason for the, the celebrations and the feast days that God prescribed for them to do, to stop and take some time out just to remember. Remembering is huge in keeping our hearts soft and pliable. The reason that we gather uh, monthly to celebrate communion is the same. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, he said, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Read it with me. Do this in remembrance of me. At the communion table, we remember how Jesus suffered and died to include us in the family of God, to set us free from sin and death and hell, and we do it because remembering keeps our hearts soft. It changes us. It keeps us grateful and accepting and expecting. You know, if God would do this for us, Paul says, why would he withhold any good thing from you? 
Jesus wanted us to have physical touch points to trigger our memory. Communion is an interactive event aimed at keeping his sacrifice and our value to him fresh in our hearts and, uh, and on our minds. Don't you remember Jesus asked the disciples? We want to remember his sacrifice. We want to remember the accounts of his faithfulness in Scripture. But we also want to remember what he's done for us personally. You got your own God story. You got a history with Jesus that spans your entire life. When you think about the specific ways that he's led you and answered your prayers, it'll stir your faith. It'll soften you. A couple of weeks ago, I told a bit of my story at the St. City Conference on Saturday night. Wes, uh, when he first asked me to do it, I was sitting with him and a couple others in my office back here, and, and uh, he just point blank asked me, he said, how did it happen? What, uh, how'd you end up here? And, and I, you know, without, without really thinking through it, I answered with one sentence. I said, God called my name. And I choked up and couldn't talk for a few minutes. Remembering how I felt in that moment made me realize, man, I have got to go over this more. And not for the sake of others, I gotta do this for me. I need to remember this. He called my name. That was a watershed moment in my life. That totally changed the entire trajectory of where I was headed. Another was losing our first baby, when Debbie was in her seventh month of her pregnancy, uh, driving home from the hospital that night, I'm alone. I am just pouring out my heart to God, letting him know how hurt I was that he didn't intervene. I mean, we had prayed, we had cried. But I just, I told him, I said, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust you. I'm not gonna quit trusting you. I ended up worshiping him, just singing a song, a worship song to him, with my heart absolutely crushed. And it was another one of those moments where I sensed the presence of God coming to that car, and it was tangible. I mean, it was the nearness, the tenderness, the affection that I felt from the Lord. And remembering that just still comforts me. It softens my heart. In the early days here, my dad was an integral part of this church, and when he was dying with cancer, uh, you know, I was losing it. I went out on the little balcony uh, by our bedroom one night, and I just pleaded with the Lord. I said, God, you just can't let him die. I can't imagine going on without him. I mean, do something, intervene. And it was one of those handful of times that I heard God speak to me. And if it had been an audible voice, it would not have been any clear. I mean, the words were clear. God said, I'm going to take care of you. It's going to be Okay. And here's what you need to say to your dad. And then there were some very specific words. It turned out those were the exact words that my dad had been asking God to tell me. It was like his golden ticket to go to heaven. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, <laughs> he was as excited if somebody said, we're going to Disneyland. I mean, it was literally that, that, that clear those defining moments say, Marcus, they're places we can look back and we can remember the power and presence and faithfulness and mercy of God. So Jesus helps the disciples remember here in verse 19. He says, don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls did you pick up? They replied, 12. Okay, good. And I broke seven loaves for the 4,000. How many baskets? Seven. And he says, is this not registering? <laughs> Do you guys still not get it here? We got one loaf of bread, but I'm here. So there's obviously not going to be a food shortage. You know, they're going, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right. He said, I was talking about the corruption of the Pharisees. The, you know, is not having food all you guys tend to think about? I mean, within a year, I'm going to be gone, guys. You're going to be the leaders of salvation history. I need you to lock into what's happening here. You know, get your heads around what I'm saying, what's going on. The future of the whole church is riding on how you respond to me. Years later, you know, they'll remember all kinds of things they saw Jesus do and heard him say, and they'll start to get anxious. And then we go, oh, wait, 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 wait. 
yeah, that's right, we fed 5,000 people with a handful of, you know, food and had 12 baskets or left up. Well, okay, we're good, we're good, we're all right. When God does something for you, let me, let me tell you what you ought to do. Write it down. You think, oh, man, you, are you kidding? I'll never forget this. Trust me, you will. You will. You know one of the benefits of me teaching you on a weekly basis? I write these things down. I write these stories down, and I go back over them, and I go, oh, yeah. You know, write down your story. It'll soften your heart. It'll strengthen your faith. You really do need to combat hardness of heart because we're all subject to it. And if it's something that would bless all of it, send it to me and I'll get it out there, you know, so we all get encouraged, all right? Now in Mark 8, 27, they're on their way to another village in Galilee, and Jesus asks them, who do people say that I am? And he answers very, John the Baptist, some say you're one of the prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah, and they've uh, been with him more than two years now, and it's just been a miracle after mind-blowing miracle, and they realize that he is the Messiah, the most anointed man to ever live. But then a couple of months ago, a couple of chapters back, they've seen him walking on the water and controlling the, you know, nature, and they realize he's got to be more than a man. <laughs> They're thinking, he must be God. And here in Mark 8, 29, Jesus is pressing that point. He's asking, okay, guys, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you're the Messiah. And in Matthew 16, 16, he adds, the son of the living God. You can see, you know, there's been a progression of revelation here. I mean, that's a, that's a quantum leap. Jesus is the Messiah, and he is God. I mean, that's a big leap from the most anointed man to the Genesis 1 creator. Jesus says, that's good. You're, you're coming around. You're getting it. But there's more. Verse 31, now he's going to blow their mind again. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. <laughs> you're right about me being the Messiah and God. But you also need to know that I have to die. And yes, you did hear that right. The miracle-working, water-walking, most anointed man who is also God is going to die. And they're thinking, wait, what? We just got here. I mean, we just got this. We finally believe you're God. God can't die, Jesus. What are you saying? Is that even possible? Jesus is telling them, all right, here's the plan. I know this is going to this is going to, you know, take you to a new place. I'm going to save the nation of Israel and fully pay for the sins of all people for all time by dying as the perfect human. And they're thinking, where in the world does God say the Messiah dies? Well, actually, prophet Isaiah spells it out vividly in chapter 53. But to this day, the Jewish leaders have not connected those dots. They're thinking, this isn't the Messiah world. We're looking for a man who will defeat Rome. And Jesus says, that'll happen. But it's 2,000 years down the road. First, I have to die. And here's the fourth big revelation. I also must rise again. And now he's going to teach them the resurrection basics. He said, I'm going to rise from the dead as a human, and I'm going to raise all of you from the dead, and you're going to reign with me on the earth. <laughs> all right, Jesus, now you're, you, you've blown our minds. What in the world is that all about? Verse 31, the key word here is he began to teach them. It's a brand new idea. This man walking down the road with you who's cooking dinner and slip, sleeping on the ground with you. You've heard him snore and laugh. You've seen him cry. This man is both Messiah and God, and the elders in Jerusalem are going to kill him. What? I mean, Think about how utterly scandalous that sounds to these young Jewish guys who grew up in Israel. Not our guys. We're the good guys. Jesus, no, you can't, you can't say that. Jesus is not. That's exactly what's going to happen. Our leaders will reject me and have me crucified, but I'm going to rise again. Now, Peter finally can't take anymore. He pulls Jesus aside from the others and says, Jesus, you know, I don't like doing this. I really don't like to do this, but I think you have gone off the deep end this time. I mean, 
if you keep this up, we're not going to have anybody following that. You're going to tank the campaign. We're not going to have any offerings. You know, it, it, it's, it's, this is just, this is crazy talk. Now, of course, all the other apostles are watching. Peter goes, Lord, I'm just saying, if you're the Messiah and you're God, it's game over. We win. That's it. God's not going to let you die. We're not going to let you die. I got a sword. And here's what Jesus does, verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter, Satan's inspiring you to think this way. The cross is the power of salvation. Have you noticed the devil's always pushing a crossless Christianity? Jesus says, you don't, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Humans don't want a cross. Savior of the world on a cross is scandalous. And we especially don't want a Messiah who leads us to the cross. You know, our, in our mind, death and suffering is synonymous with tribulation, the end of the world stuff. You know, we don't want a cross anywhere near. But here's the crux of the conflict. Our dark desires are always going to be colliding with the will of God. And when we embrace what He wants over what we want, that's called dying to self. That's the cross Jesus calls us to. And the same God who orders, orchestrated the crucifixion of His Son is orchestrating ours. Only it's not to earn anything, it's to put to death the deeds of darkness in our fallen human nature that are destroying us. Things like selfishness and pride and lust and anger and envy and lying and deceit. Resisting sin and embracing the will of God is the way of the cross. So verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples. Meant this is more than just for the 12 now. This is the way for everybody. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, control their comfort zone, avoid any kind of pain, they're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You see, here's the reason you don't need to worry about me leading you to the cross, because I'm also going to raise you from the dead. The cross is simply saying no to self and yes to me. And the rewards are going to so far outweigh the pain. It's going to be worth it, more than you can even imagine. Verse 38, Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with, his, with the holy angels. And one of the primary ways we embrace the cross right now, and it's going to get more and more intense in the days ahead, is to stand for all that Jesus stands for. Because our natural tendency is to be silent when there's any kind of stigma involved. Jesus is calling us to follow his lead wherever it takes, to support his platform when it's unpopular, to make his choices our choices, no matter what the cost. Matthew 16, 24, or 27, Jesus adds one more thing. He says, for the Son of Man, <clears throat> and we want to keep that in our head. He said, I'm, I'm going to die as a man, as a man I'm going to be raised. I'm going to be both God and man forever in a resurrected human body, and I'm going to come back to the earth in my Father's glory, and guys, listen to me, I'm going to reward every one of you in the resurrection according to what you've done. He's saying, as my disciples, you're going to follow in my footsteps. You're going to deny yourselves. You're going to make costly choices just like I have, and you're going to be rewarded in the age to come just like me, just like I'll be rewarded. Here's the, here's the big lesson. Our rewards are time delayed. We get some here in this age, but the big ones come when the Lord returns. And they'll last forever. They'll be remembered forever. Jesus is saying, you're going to have the glory of God in your life in a way that will be so worth any sacrifice you make right now. It's going to be the, the, the same for you as it is for me. I won't see all the fruit till later. And this is hard truth. He just told them that they're going to be carrying the cross the rest of their life, but now he's going to help them to get this in a way that's going to just pour steel into their backbones. He's, he's about to show them the glory 
of this coming realm. I mean, this is so ingenious. This is so cool. Mark 9, 1, he said to them, truly I tell you, some of those, some some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. And then this happens. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. Now, I don't know how they figured that out, but I guess just in the dialogue, in the conversation. He changes right in front of them. The glory of God is released into his physical body. Matthew 17, 2 says, it made his face shine like the sun and his clothes became white as light. <clears throat> the curtains pull back. And these three disciples witness God's kingdom coming in the man, Jesus. They're getting a peek at where this is all going. He continued, he, he's confirming rather that all this stuff that he's told them, you know, uh, six days before, this is the way I'll look when I come back, but first I'm going to die. Just wanted you guys to see how it all ends. I don't fail. This has been the plan from the beginning. Nothing's changed. It just feels like things are real unstable right now, but nothing's changed. This was always the plan. Now, you can bet that image is seared into their brains. You know, they're definitely going to need it, too, because they've got some rough days ahead. Peter, James, and John go back and tell the others, we saw the prophet Elijah and Moses, the lawgiver, the two of Israel's greatest men. I mean, you've got to think about it from their perspective. The very presence of these two men are a massive endorsement of Jesus' claim that his death and resurrection are the way forward. Luke 9.31 tells us they, they, Moses and Elijah, so they're standing there talking to Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about, he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Jesus is about to bring it all together on the cross. What's about to happen is not a mystery. It's not like, oh, guys, things are, you know, I don't know what's about that. No, no, he's very much in charge of his living and his dying. He said that. He said, I don't, no man takes my life. I'm going to lay it down. Now, think about what's happening here. These three watch and listen to Jesus discussing his death with two dead guys. At least one of them died. Elijah was caught up to heaven alive. Well, I don't know what that means, you know, what that looks like. But they're, they're looking at the man who parted the Red Sea and the other who called down fire from heaven. Can you imagine the adrenaline that's flowing? <laughs> Verse 7, then a cloud appeared and covered him, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. My favor's on him. Nothing's wrong here, guys. This has always been the plan. It's all coming together. Listen to him. He's telling you the truth. He's going to die. He's going to come back. You're going to embrace the cross. You're going to experience resurrection power, and the goodness of everything you do in his name will last forever. Listen to him. Well, they're walking back down the mountain. Peter's going, wow, Lord, guess the train's not off the track. <laughs> I get, I get, you, you've really got this, don't you? I mean, you, you really, and, and man, suddenly, you know, they're connecting dots. They didn't even know we're you know, meant for each other, they, 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 stuff they had totally missed. Jesus wants us to know that we're going to make costly choices to follow him. He's clearly telling us, I'm the Messiah who dies, and I'm going to lead you to die to you. I'm going to lead you to say no to the spirit of this world, the spirit of this age. And at times, it's going to come down to some costly choices. Mark 8, 43 says, if your hand causes you to sin, be radical. Get rid of it. And he's not encouraging self-mutilation. He said, make the kind of choices I made. I went to the cross. Break your agreement with immorality. Don't just, don't just meddle in it. Get rid of it. Get away from it. Get, break your agreement with the acts of darkness because of where we're going together forever, because of where this is going. And then he ends it here in verse 49, with everyone will be salted with fire. And he's talking about believers and the fire of purification. Old Testament sacrifices were salted before they were offered to God. Three times in the Old Testament, it's called a covenant of salt. In ancient days, an agreement between two people were, was symbolized by salt. It represented the life and enduring nature of the uh, alliance. 
we offer our lives to God the same way Jesus did. We say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. I lay down my desires for what you want. Paul said it like this in Romans 12, 1. He said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, where this is all going, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And when you do that, you are going to look back and think, this is so, this was so worth it. It is so worth it. I think one of the most sobering passages in Scripture is something Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 13. Look at this, verse 12. He says, anyone who builds on that foundation, he's talking about Jesus, may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Yeah, I don't know if you've been watching, you know, these poor people out in Santa Rosa, California. I mean, they can tell us a, a lot about what this is like. We married our son and daughter-in-law in, in, uh, in a big barn-like structure, just beautiful thing. Uh, I was talking to Clayton this week, and uh, he said, yeah, Dad, he said, that thing burned to the ground. He said, it's just, dude, there's just whole city areas, population areas that just are completely gone. I don't want any of us w watching our entire life go up in smoke because that, that's what Paul says is going to happen. I want our works to endure the fire. I want to see you get rewarded big time. You know the reason I'm teaching a message like this? Because I want you to be rewarded big time in the age to come. I want to hear you say, thanks for challenging me, Ryan to make sacrifices, to be a disciple maker. Thanks for warning me not to take the easy road and to back off. Thanks for, you know, making me uncomfortable and telling me to take up my cross. The gospel is a radical commitment to a radical command who lived that, out that commitment himself. Jesus only leads us to where he's already gone because that's where the glory of God is. Now, I've just been, you know, I've been on this all week. I'm thinking... You know, it's time for us to re-up. It's time for us to admit some things to ourselves, about ourselves. I've had to say to myself, you know, your heart's way too hard right now. You, you need a major softening, you know. You, you need to be crying out to God to change things. It's time to let Jesus know you're all in, that you're ready to take up your cross, you're ready to follow his leadership, to get involved in making at least one disciple. This year, to tackle some of those things you've been, you know, that have been pulling you away from your devotion to Jesus, to turn some things off, to commit yourself to spend more time in His Word and in prayer, to get involved here, to serve on a team here, to own this ministry, to own this place, to earn, own this church and be a part of what God's doing here, to show up every weekend instead of just occasionally, to join a small group. Listen, these words are going to ring in your ears. Jesus is the only reason for living. And I'm just, I've just been asking, God, just wake us up to this. Just give us, give us the clarity to see this is all that matters. This is all that matters. All those things that we think are so precious and are so wonderful are not going to do anything for us. They're going to weigh us down. I want us to just come to him in genuine surrender this morning and say to him just what Jesus said to the Father, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to go all in. Can we do that? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? I really do believe this is what we want. And I just, I know there are a bunch of you here. The Holy Spirit's messing with you. I mean, this, this message has has hit home and you're I don't even have to put a finger on the things that the Holy Spirit has put a finger on your life you know some things that you need to let go of some things that you need to change some things that you need to turn around 
This could be your jump start here this morning. This could be that, that point, that moment in your life where you get freedom from some things, where you get God's help, where you get your heart reconnected. If you need healing, if you need God to just touch your physical body today, a presence of the Holy Spirit is here in this room. This is the atmosphere to receive from the Lord. Jack uh, Deere just got back from a conference where he said they had some real, genuine, miracle healings that took place. You know, deaf ears open. So, you know, I believe God wants to do it here, right here, right now. If you need healing, uh, this is the time to come forward. All right, let me pray for you. Lord, would you do what you love to do? Would you just come by your spirit and touch us today? Would you heal us? Would you help us? Would you jumpstart our hearts? Would you change us? Would you soften us? Would you free us from addictions and all the darkness in our heart? Lord, come now. As we surrender to you, would you come now and touch us and minister to us in Jesus' name?